Rick and Morty presents Mr. Meeseeks. We start out seeing Summer talk on the phone, probably with one of her friends, saying boring stuff. But she's making a six-hour chili recipe, probably to impress a guy who wants a domestic girl. And she quickly gets bored with cooking and sends out Mr. Meeseeks. I love that she's smart enough to interrupt him in his predictable dialogue. She tells him to make sure this chili gets stirred every 20 minutes for the next six hours. He's told, you know we Meeseeks literally live for this kind of thing. Even though Summer already met Meeseeks in the show, and so she already knows this, she still feels the need to say that that's sad. She says that life's too short for meaningless tasks, and it's rich and full of good surprises. It seems out of character for Summer to not be cynical when she's so negative all the time, but she's been naive and easily tricked multiple times. So apparently she's a negative idealist. She shouldn't be mistreating him by saying she feels sad for him when he's willing to help her. She watches TV, telling it what to do with the voice command, and Mesex wishes he understood how people find meaning in life, since he was interacted with like this. So he recklessly summons some Meeseeks of his own, and asks him what the meaning of life is. He's told that there is no meaning of life, and it's all just chaos and pain. Well, that's probably true if you're going by pure logic. He asks why he hasn't disappeared. Yeah, why hasn't he? The Meeseeks would be programmed to agree with this nihilistic idea because they're programmed by Rick. And sure, the pain part would make sense for a Meeseeks to say because they're always in pain. But as for chaos, they've never experienced any chaos before. They just got created. So why hasn't he disappeared? He seemed confident in what he said, so it's not like he knew he was wrong and not completing his task. I would figure it would be up to the Meeseeks' brain to determine whether he's completed his task or not. So Mr. Meeseeks says that humans seem to find some meaning in being alive regardless, so there's probably something to being alive. The other Meeseeks with hair is pissed that he has to figure that out for him. Couldn't Mr. Meeseeks have asked Summer how she finds meaning in life? He probably assumes she can't figure it out and assumes that since Rick made the Meeseeks programming, that would know if anyone. But how would he expect a different Meeseeks to know something he doesn't, and have a different opinion? He should have waited for Rick to come home and ask him because he's smart. But I guess he doesn't know Rick exists yet, programming or not. I wish the text box said something less vague than soon. We see the chilly Meeseeks wearing a chef's hat. I'm glad because it helps distinguish him from the other guy better at first glance and lets me give him an actual name to refer to. Chef Meeseeks. We see the Meeseeks in front of a laptop, trying to tell him the answer to his question. He says in idiom that life's not about waiting for the storm to pass, it's about learning to dance in the rain. That sounds like it means life's about having fun. So that's what Morty said to Summer in the show, the anti-nihilist approach. Life sucks, no one's special, so let's watch TV. Summer could have told him that. She was doing that. Somehow he dismisses all of the idioms as terrible. Probably because he's too literal-minded to understand. He says that he thinks he isn't even trying. Misek says that these are from a tab on Jerry's computer marked Inspirations. He says that humanity is chaotic and miserable. So how does anyone find purpose in the world? Is he just programmed by Rick to think this? Because he just showed up. How do you already figure this out just by reading inspirational quotes and being totally isolated? How does he even know how to read? Though it makes sense, because trust is something people have to learn. From repeated experience. And if someone was isolated their whole life, he wouldn't learn trust. So it makes sense that a Meeseeks would assume people can't be trusted. If they get told that the butter passing robot knows his purpose, and it's to pass the butter. And he knows it's unfulfilling. It was amusing seeing the expression of Meeseeks because of that. This helps the chilly guy who has a purpose, but it doesn't help the Meeseeks who was given an impossible task. The butter robot gets thrown to the floor, probably out of jealousy. The Meeseeks complains about his job in front of Rick and how he doesn't have much time to complete it. It's kind of amusing how long he goes on about it. Rick tells him with a smile that life has no meaning. But most sentient beings find the raw chaos of existence too terrifying, so they try to make themselves feel better and not think about it. Meeseeks thanks him at least, and says that he already tried to tell Chef this and he doesn't accept it. 
Rick says it sucks to be him and tells him to use anything he needs from the garage because he'll need it. At least that's responsible in a sense because he's trying to make sure they have help fulfilling their task. Because he knows how murderous the Meeseeks can end up being if he lives too long. But he'd be smarter if he just teleported the Meeseeks away with its portal gun. Meeseeks summons another Meeseeks to do Chef's task, which upsets him. And Rick completely ignores what's going on and tries to fix up Butter Robot when he doesn't want that at all. Why are there two? Oh, that's supposed to be the exact same pair of Meeseeks behind them. It's trying to illustrate the same UFO moving, but it shouldn't be all on one panel because that's just confusing. Chef admits that he's being silly. That should make Meeseeks disappear just fine. Rick would have programmed the Meeseeks to be made to disappear whenever the person wants, but he really wanted to make sure he was motivated to have that task completed, no matter what it was. You think he would have reprogrammed the Meeseeks box after the first time it screwed up? Chef says the Meeseeks aren't born fumbling for meaning like humans. They're created to serve one purpose. Meeseeks said he was right the first time, and their lives don't have meaning. But feeling driven to end isn't the same thing as having purpose in life. Never mind that Chef just told him that his purpose is to stir chili. Meeseeks says that helping people is what Meeseeks are drawn to. So they should keep doing that. That is the strongest, best argument. Someone sees him flying the spaceship, and he's a homeless man, so the Meeseeks go to see him. He admits that he'll own up to his mistakes, but he doesn't have any feet. He says that a vengeful Pickle lasered him off and left him for dead. So Pickle Rick did that to him? He says that his insurance wouldn't cover his disability because what happened to him was too ridiculous. Why would he say that psychiatrists say he has PPTSD when that isn't a term that exists? It only happened to him. That's a terrible joke. He's scared at seeing the Meeseeks eat a pickle. And the Meeseeks offers to give him some new clothes. See Chef running away carrying some stolen clothes. Which the homeless guy doesn't want because he's trying to turn his life around. Yeah, and he might be blamed and arrested for wearing them. One failed attempt at helping someone doesn't exactly disprove the idea that helping people is the thing. It's just one time, and of course the Meeseeks suck at it. They act outside the law. I guess the Meeseeks looked it up on the internet, and that's how he knows already that every year tons of clothes are destroyed by their own retailers. Which he says is a justification. Chef says the Meeseeks don't care about morality. And Meeseek says that since the insurance company cheated the homeless guy out of his house after years of payments, they should steal a car, and they'll be the ones to put the bill. He asks how he knows that car is insured by the same company. He doesn't, realistically, and just urges him to get into the hot-wired car, or else he'll get arrested. The story cuts ahead of the car chase to them being in the desert, and Meeseek says he hoped a near-death experience would make Chef appreciate being alive. But Chef says he'd rather be stirring chili. Of course, it wasn't a real near-death experience. Meeseeks can't die until they do their task. So we shouldn't have even called it that. When he tells the homeless guy that they were helping him to make him feel better, calling him a charity case, the homeless guy gets offended by the truth and calls them selfish like the rest of them. Chef says that Meeseeks lived to help. The homeless guy lampshades that their catchphrase, look at me, makes it sound like everything's about them. That's smart of the writer to write. Meeseeks explains it as a call for the summoners to stay focused on them so that they'll get assigned their tasks right away. It's redundant though. So it's more like a catchphrase, and Rick believes in those for some reason. The homeless guy doesn't get it right away, and instead says that look at me is the subtext of people who will never be happy and fill the hole inside. But there's more to life than that. He says that what makes life worth living is good times. There's two pages where they're doing something happy, and it's not properly explained what's going on. I just see them hugging a horse with some woman nearby. Then they have to bury someone, and the homeless guy says that pleasure can't last and this all wasn't worth it. Whatever happened, it seems like a diabolic ex machina. Maybe they got high on psychedelic drugs and bad things happened? And of course a Meeseeks that doesn't believe in the law would immediately jump to that for pleasure, even though there's a trillion different other ways to have pleasure. So again, it's not handling the argument perfectly, but 
but there are Mr. Maysteaks, after all. He's so full of despair that he thinks he shouldn't have turned his back on the church. And Maysteaks sees a giant sign saying that real meaning comes from above, and asks if he knows many people who find fulfillment in religion. The sign says to come visit Mount Rushmore, and when they go to the building, someone says they knew he'd find aliens eventually. The Maysteaks are mistaken for aliens by a bunch of people who are all dressed the same, as if they're in a cult. The guy says they've been awaiting them and are prepared to receive the great mysteries of the universe, and they want to livestream this. Instead of telling him the truth, the Maysteaks says that he wants to know how they came to find meaning and happiness in their beliefs. I'm so relieved that they're talking to these more unique, if weird, religious people. That was a twist. The cult leader says that they aren't happy, and have been denying themselves pleasure in order to earn their way into an afterlife where they will be happy. He asks if that's how the universe works. That is how the universe works, right? Chef says that the Mystics can read the universe on a scale the likes of which humans can't fathom. Wait, so Mystics can learn anything they want from anywhere? I guess the Akashic Records really are real in Rick and Morty, and Hippie Rick wasn't just kidding. Or they just tap into the internet from anywhere. But that would be something humans could fathom. Chef tells these guys that there's no sign of any afterlife, and the universe is only proven to be a meaningless accident. So the cult can't handle the truth and wants to unlock the poisonous Kool-Aid. The idea that that one cult in real life drank it willingly was a myth. They're just forced into it at gunpoint. If the cult was really listening to him, they would have gone on to have happy lives instead of getting themselves killed as soon as possible. Which would only make sense if they believed in an afterlife they would go to. So after they kill themselves, Misik says, So, scratch religion, what's next? They get thrown in jail, presumably because they're refraining from fighting so they can stay with a homeless guy. Chef lampshade they should have just stayed with the chili. What was the Misik's holding? How did he get a prison card and unlock the jail cell without the owner of the card noticing? We should have seen him get it. The Maysteaks walk out of the jail cell while leaving the homeless guy to die. I don't see why the prison guard would grab him and ask him if he's trying to escape and attack him when he's clearly just staying behind there and has no legs. Chef says that Maysteaks clearly doesn't believe life is worth living and is just trying to complete his task so he can die too. Maysteaks lies and is told that he's only arguing for meaning because he was asked to, and Maysteaks have no free will. Maysteaks says that's not true. Because Maysteaks can make all kinds of choices. Maysteaks presses the button to unlock every cell door. So they're in outright prison, not jail? That would take months to get to. I hope the prison guard turning around and being scared means that he's going to get what he deserves. And the whole time the Maysteaks are ignoring the violence around them to talk to each other. Maysteaks says he hopes he'll see the beauty in life even if he fails. Someone says to tell his wife he loves her. So Maysteaks says, that's it! And kisses Chef. It was funny that Chef was grossed out and asked, I'm Mr. Maysteaks and what the fuck was that? Maysteaks wonders if the romantic family unit bonding love is the true source of meaning and happiness, asking why it took so long for him to realize this. You get meaning from that by being relied on as someone providing money to your family, and relied on as someone to love and be an emotional crutch. Why don't they just cut out the middleman and just say that meaning in life is having a job? Why are the code black rushers completely ignoring them? Chef pushes him back saying that he's insane, and that two people can't bring each other meaning if they lack it themselves. And it would be foolish and cruel to pin one's happiness on another flawed, incomplete person. Everyone's flawed and incomplete. Then Chef says that half of marriages end in divorce, and half of relationships experience cheating. Again, I guess he's in contact with the Akashic Records that Magic is in contact with. Because he was just born. He wouldn't know anything yet. They argue that it's not very likely that a relationship would last. Misik says that people can't have a true relationship if they get into it for different reasons, or if there's a power imbalance. Chef asks how likely it is that two people would be and stay totally imbalanced with each other for a lifetime. Chef asks why he should build his whole sense of value around one person who would just die and leave you alone and no longer whole. That's the risk you have to take. That wasn't as compelling as the rest of his argument. I think Rick's bias against his ex-wife Diane found his way into his programming there. Because that's an opinion of Rick's. So that argues against relationship love, not family love. 
Chef points out that Meeseeks don't even have family, and they've never been whole. It's convenient that they're able to hear each other over the prison ride around them, and that they aren't getting hurt. Meeseeks asks Chef if he could have a new life with the family who cared for him, where he does belong. Chef says they have no way of knowing and discovering those answers before their minds deteriorate as an incentive to do tasks faster. Getting an idea, Meeseeks whistles and summons the UFO just like that. They fly over to Blips and Chits, and Meeseeks says that the Roy Virtual Life game is the answer to their problem, because they can discover what human life is like for themselves. I guess the page is split in half between the character that Chef is controlling and the character Meeseeks is. The girl character says that she needs to go make a boy fall in love with her so that they can have meaning before they die. Her life jumps ahead, and she wonders if she'll never find a guy. And her cynical mother doesn't believe in love at all, since her husband cheated on her. The girls from the girl want to see the guy that was going to be her type play football, and he gets hurt when doing so. Meanwhile, we see what's probably the virtual father of Chef complain about chili for dinner again, and the wife says that when he volunteers to cook, he can pick what they have. So Chef ends up getting hurt at football. They end up becoming friends in the game, going to a carnival, kissing in the car, going to the dance, as I don't know what their personalities are like. Then we see the girl complain that this is her dad and his intern all over again, as someone's holding a cell phone. Then she cries over someone in the hospital. We see some small text on the phone revealing that Chef had cheated on her, and the text message apologizes that he just felt scared at the idea of being defined by one relationship until he died. It turns out that Chef, who's on crutches, is told that it was an athletic scholarship, and his grades certainly don't qualify him to stay here. Meanwhile, the girl graduates while he ends up holding a sign. The girl says that the pay is great, but doesn't feel like what she's supposed to do. And she's upset at being given paperwork. And Chef's unemployed. He ends up in AA and says he's been sober for one year. He's reunited with by Meeseeks' girl character, and didn't order the chili because things change. She says that real love is grown when two caring people share a connection and understanding. Wouldn't they have gotten that in their relationship earlier? They had plenty of time to talk. She says people who work to support each other and cultivate a shared path. Then out of nowhere, some bullshit in the game happens where something falls from the ceiling and kills her. And the Meeseeks chef gets excited and tries to die in the game over and over again and has to be pulled away. They go home, and the replacement Meeseeks confuses me by saying that enough water boiled off that he had to start stirring every 10 minutes instead of 20. I don't get it. He's not doing his task correctly because that means he's not obeying his order exactly. Wouldn't this be against his programming? Wouldn't this doom him to never disappearing? Somehow Chef doesn't get this, and says that he thought about that at one point and wanted to call him, but couldn't get to a phone because he was being sniff searched by prison dogs. Misix hopes that he could find what's fulfilling for him, unlike humans, and hopes he can get past all the pointless noise in the moment and try enough different things to find something you might not expect. Chef says that he was so fixated on the idea of a singular truth that it never occurred to him that each individual might be able to find unique meaning in their own life. That, that was obvious from the start. And thankfully, the writer does have Meeseeks disappear, and before he could be told the answer of how, Chef feels sorry for him for disappearing too early to learn the answer, and wants to honor his sacrifice and find a unique meaning for himself. That can't last. The new chef says that he's perfectly happy to just fulfill his task. Chef says that he's just scared that pursuing real fulfillment and meaning might be heartbreaking or impossible. Um, he's pursuing real fulfillment now. He's happy, and he's doing what he was told to help someone. I guess it makes sense that Chef is trying to pull this guy into it because they end up teaching him the truth after all, no matter how much he went through. But he should have the compassion of someone who wants to help to know that Meeseeks are made to get miserable and be in constant pain the longer they live. And so he's only going to cause harm by dragging Meeseeks away from the real task to explore life. All he'd end up doing is creating an army of furious, murderous Meeseeks with deteriorated minds and bodies. Not to mention you'd think the new chef would have heard the revelation of the Meeseeks, and so he would have learned the meaning of life too. Thankfully, after Summer says this chili is perfect, Chef disappears. Then she thanks the other one, who disappears as well. Then we see someone say that the brownies are delicious, and it's too bad they're out because he's hungry. He asks if anyone tried that bean soup, like Jeremy. 
Jeremy says he didn't try the chili because it's mom food. He says that he's into prison chicks now, not domesticated girls. So he's fickle. Summer dumps chili in the garbage without even trying it herself. And with that, the story ends. This story was about two Mr. Meeseeks trying to find out what gives life meaning. Naturally, it didn't involve much sci-fi or action because it was mostly just a philosophical discussion between the characters, but it was almost interesting enough to not bore me because it moved on from one argument to the next at a fast enough pace. I love that they tried out the Roy Human Simulation game. The whole story happened because Summer just had to uncharacteristically say that a Meeseeks existence is sad to its face. And that spurred him on to ask Meeseeks a hard question. And because he's naive and new to the world, it took the whole story to occur to him that the meaning of life is defined differently for every individual. No duh. Everyone has their hobbies. It was obvious from the beginning that Chef already had meaning in his life and he was dragged away from it. The Meeseeks know their purpose. And I love that the writer was self-aware of the Meeseeks, explaining why they say, look at me, and deconstructing them. That's how smart the writer is. And because it's a dark comedy, the chilly Summer asked for didn't even achieve what she wanted and impress that guy. Maybe she should have asked him what he'd like to eat first, like a smart person. I assumed the only reason she picked chili was that she knew he liked chili. But it's so likely that someone won't like chili because it's spicy. So why would you pick that of all things?